the handout that you've got in front of you is, is uh, actually just a warm-up activity. Uh, uh, we're teachers, we use warm-up activities. Um, uh, if you came to my session yesterday, you'll probably know a little bit about this already, uh, but if not, I'll explain later. What we have here is uh, um, uh, 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 some, some student writing from uh, a university in Korea, and uh, th in each case, the students are using a form of the word expect. Okay? Now, what I, would what, I've, uh, uh, what I was initially thinking of doing was asking you to look through all of these different instances of the word expect and classify them according to what meaning the student is making. But I realized that would probably take us 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, so I've actually classified them for you already. You may not agree with my classification, to be honest, but uh, uh, nevertheless. What I would like you to do briefly uh, by yourself or with chatting to the person next to you is uh, uh, give me a kind of little short one or two word gloss for the, each group. So... Uh, look at the uh, look at say group one here. Uh, look at what's going on in each case. They should basically all be the same thing. They should be making the same meaning. And just write down what you think the meaning is, and then go on to uh, group two and group three. There's eight groups all together, and some of them are not really groups at all. There's only one instance to look at. So uh, if I give you five minutes for that, group one, what what sort of what meaning is being made here? Would you say? Look yeah, look forward to yes. Uh, group two. Expect, yes? I mean, they're, they're, they may not always be using it grammatically correctly, but the meaning is, is right, isn't it? They're, they're choosing expect, and they want to say expect, and that they've got the right choice there. Group three. Hope. Yes, hope, yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, tr trying to explain to students the difference between hoping and expecting is not, not really very easy. And Actually, corporate are very good for this. I guess most of you... Uh, um, in this room already know that, and that's probably what attracts you to corpus linguistics. When students ask you those really tricky questions, what's the difference between hope and expect? And uh, you show them a concordance, and they immediately go, ah, all right, okay. They can see it straight away. Um, whereas if you give them a sort of semantically based explanation, they, they immediately, yeah, they think, I have no, I either think, I have no idea what you're talking about, or, um, yeah, or they're satisfied with your explanation, then a week later they come back with a counterexample, and they say, you said... <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so the blood runs cold in your veins, you know, the, you said. Uh, um, group three, yeah, group three we, we think is hope. Group four, uh, these are two different students, <laughs> but they, someone's copied from someone else, I think, here. So <laughs> uh, this, this never happens, does it? But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's another use of corpus linguistics plagiarism detection. Um, uh, uh, group four. Predicted, yeah, it's predict, yeah. Uh, group five? Yeah, it's spelling, it's spelling mistake, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and uh, group seven? Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yeah I, 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 I struggled with this for quite a long time. I had more time to think about it than you, and I, I thought maybe expect, yeah. In the end, my answer was um, uh, I, I wasn't surprised that. Yeah, uh, something like that. You know, uh, um, that it's no surprise that this movie was awarded many prizes, something like that. <coughs> but I'm not absolutely sure about that one. And Group Eight are the I don't know. Oh, sorry, at the back, yes. We, which one are we talking about? Six or seven? Oh, so Group Six. Yeah, Group Six is is I, I'm counting on you. Sorry, I, I sorry I skipped over that one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, group six is, is um, yeah, I'm relying on you, I'm counting on you, or, yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, quite, quite a subtle meaning, actually, difficult to, exp to, to sort of get across. Sorry, yeah, group, group seven is um, the, the, as I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not surprised, and group eight, I, I just couldn't figure out. There were several possibilities, and I couldn't actually tell which it was here. So I just put, I've got that, you know, undecided category at the bottom. Now, um, uh, um, Again, if you, if you were at my session yesterday, we all, you know I, I was talking a little bit about this example. But just for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, th this, this kind of work is nothing new. Teachers have always been uh, using student errors as, as a source of uh, you know, supplementary materials, uh, activities, and so on. But it's kind of difficult, isn't it, to uh, get enough examples of this uh, to present to students in, a, in an interesting or usable form. But, of course, nowadays... Uh, what we can do with our student, uh, students' uh, essays is uh, collect them into corpora, learner corpora. We can say, okay, well, rather than students just kind of writing stuff for me and then it just disappears on the wind, I can save it in a plain text file and then I can load it into this software, something like this, 
and then I can start searching it and uh, producing materials based on these. And of course, the more, the more my students write, the more essays they submit to me, the bigger my database gets and the more, I, more confidence I can be about sort of identifying my students' problems. Um, again, I'm sorry for the repetition if you were at my session yesterday, but this is a piece of software called AntConc, um, A-N-T-C-O-N-C. -N -C. It's on the handout. And it's completely free. It was written by a guy called Lawrence Anthony, who uh, is a, a, a professor at uh, Waseda University in Tokyo. And he, he, was, he did um, our MA program some years ago, and then went on to do a PhD with us. And uh, he seems to have uh, uh, unbridled energy, and he then sort of wrote this uh, software package, which uh, uh, some of you will know of a program called Wordsmith Tools. Yeah, some of you are nodding. Uh, Wordsmith Tools is a, is a very good package, but it's, it costs quite a lot of money. This is absolutely free. Another nice thing about uh, this software is it, it comes in different flavors. You can get a Windows version, a Macintosh version, or a Linux version if you're a, a, Unix, a Linux or Unix user. So um, how does it work? Well, it's very simple. You just, uh, it's like a kind of Microsoft Office program. You just uh, go to File. Uh, we'll open a file, because I know that this one is a file. Uh, go to Users. Uh, Nicholas, sorry, the rather convoluted file path for this one. Uh, that's Dropbox. Um, this, this data comes from a corpus collected by a student of ours called Doug Huffer. Doug, are you here? No, I think he's in a business meeting actually. But, um, uh, so I, should, I can't take any credit for this. This belongs to Doug. He's just finished his dissertation and he was working on a corpus called the Doug Corpus, right? Uh, <laughs> because it's uh, Dongguk University in Gyeongju, so, which is a nice pun there. So here's the Doug Corpus. Uh, there's different versions of it. I'm going to look at this version here. There it is. And what I want to do is search for the word expect. And uh, I don't just want expect. I want expect, expects, expected, expecting. And I, I'm even going to include the noun as well. I'll, I'll include expectation. And I want all of these things at the same time. So all I do is I put a little asterisk there. And that's a, what we call a wild card. That will give you all of the different endings. Uh, and just uh, say, okay, computer, start, and there we are. So, uh, well, we can tidy that up a little bit, can't we? Um, I'll sort it uh, using, see at the bottom we've got level one, zero, that means we'll sort the, the, the word in the middle, and sort it, and it looks like that. Okay. Uh, so, how many have we got here? We've got um, 37 hits, something like that. Okay. You've seen all of these examples already. This is what's on your sheet. Okay. So now it's incredibly easy to put together uh, 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 quite large collections of student writing, which you can then analyze in this way that we've just been doing here. Okay. So uh, this, this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in uh, encouraging people to do. Uh, uh, quite how you use it is up to you. I'm, I'm not going to say too much about how, you know, which directions you can take it, and I'm going to show some examples today. But I, I'd be very interested to hear from you, hear what you're doing. Uh, if there's time, we can talk about that, that, that at the end. I think some of you are already working with Corpora. Can I, can I just uh, have a show of hands? How many people are using Corpus tools and methods in their classroom teaching already? Uh, less than half. Okay, so for some of you, it'll be, yeah, yeah, I already do this. And some of you, it'll be just entirely new. Okay. Um, right, so if we go, go to the other handout then. Um, where's my copy? Oh, here it is, yeah. Uh, I think it might be a good idea then just to, to go over a few basics. Um, if you're thinking of doing this kind of work and you think, well, that, that's kind of cool, I, I can start to play with this, um, I can do things with this, then we need to uh, establish some basics. Uh, obviously, you can't save your students' uh, data in the... If students are doing handwritten essays, that's no good. The computer can't read that. It needs to be transferred into uh, electronic form. Uh, so I guess the answer is you get your students to uh, word process. Do, do you, how many of you, do, do your students do that anyway? How, ma how many students are still writing, you know, paper? No. Most. Most, yeah. So, there's, so you would have to get them to, to write to you electronically instead, yeah. Because okay. uh, I, I wouldn't advise that you actually transcribe the handwriting yourself. That's extremely <laughs> time consuming. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm currently working on a project in the United Arab Emirates where we have a very large collection of uh, exam essays and we are transcribing them, but it's, it's taking forever. Um, 
Okay, then if we just look at the, uh, the top, uh, I've got some basics for you to follow here. First of all, if you are going to collect, start collecting corpus data, ideally you should uh, observe research ethics and get students' consent for collecting this data. I mean, this is, you know, not everyone does this, and I guess, you know, uh, um, there are different sort of practices here, but really it's a good idea to get students to say, yes, I, I do consent to you collecting this data, because you never know when you might want to make it available more widely. If you've, you've built a really nice corpus, you might think, hey, you know, why don't we put this on the internet so other researchers or other teachers can use it? Then it becomes a kind of legal issue. You do need to have consent there. Okay, so, so, so it's a good idea to get that straight. Uh, secondly, format. Uh, if you are going to start collecting your own corpus data to start doing this kind of work with, you'll need to collect plain text files. Uh, software like this does not like Word documents because Word documents contain hidden codes. You know, when you put your bold or italic or underlining and so on, you, you don't see, all you see is the bold, the italic or the underline, but actually the computer sees the codes which actually you know, implement the, these formatting. So uh, uh, um, uh, don't use that, it won't like it. Uh, PDF files are no good because they're essentially image files anyway. So, uh, so plain .txt files, uh, usually UTF-8, that Unicode encoding is the standard, okay? Um, file names, uh, um, you need to kind of think up a file name system, uh, uh, something that's gonna be fairly short, you don't want a huge long file name, but something which will be searchable in different ways, like you can search it by the gender of the student, so it would be M or F, you know, male or female. Maybe a student number, if you're anonymizing your data. Uh, maybe if it's SA2, then it would be two or something. You know, there'll be some kind of clever file system that you would develop so that you can search your, your corpus in different ways. Um, as for storage, I would, as you can see, the Doug corpus here is one text file. Uh, so uh, the, Doug actually just, just threw everything into one text file. And I wouldn't actually recommend you do this. For me, it's better to have one essay, one file. You know, to keep everything separate. And the reason for this is basically because it's what you can do when you've, you've got one essay, one file, you can then just put things together afterwards. But if you throw everything into one bag, it's then kind of almost impossible to take it all out again and separate it afterwards. So, so start, if you like, st start uh, 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 as detailed as you can and then you can aggregate things later, okay, rather than the other way around. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, also, for the same reason, I would advise that you keep things in very specific folders. All you, I mean, a corpus is not rocket science. Basically, it's just plain text files in folders. But I would, again, suggest that you make your subfolders as specific as possible. Because, again, it's easy in the software to combine folders together and search them together. But it's difficult to just say you, you've thrown everything into one big folder and you think, oh, actually, I, I want to look at students at different levels. Oh, dear. <laughs> There's no subfolders for different levels, and then you have to go into the folders and try and remember what people, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. So, so keep it specific to start with, and then you can, you can aggregate it later. Uh, finally, uh, uh, there's something called metadata. If you're going to take this seriously, uh, very seriously, and start thinking about it for research purposes, then you need to start collecting something called metadata, the data about your data. Uh, this is information about the students, you know, for example, how many years they've been studying English, uh, what their gender is, uh, what their you know, high school leaving grades were, or you know, uh, whether they've ever lived in an English-speaking country, uh, what they had for breakfast, you know, <laughs> whatever. You know, uh, as much data as you need, okay? uh, or you think you need, and possibly a bit more too, because it's, you know, uh, it's surprising actually. You, you, collect, you collect certain pieces of information, and then to, a year down the line you think, oh, I wish, I wish I'd collected their, um, you know, their university entrance exam scores as well, because now that's what I'm really interested in trying to find out about. You know. So, so collect more information than you think you need because you know, you'll be surprised, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes handy later. And of course, le a year later, it's, it, they're gone. You can't, you can't collect that information then. Okay, um, so once you've collected this, this uh, big, big bunch of plain text files, what do you do with it? Well, you get some software like this. Uh, I've already introduced this, this software, it's called AntConk. To, to get hold of a copy, you just Google AntConk and it will take you to the, uh, the author's website and uh, you just click on the link and it, it just zaps it onto your machine in about, about 10 seconds. It's quite, quite a, you know, considering how powerful it is, it's a very small program. And um, off you go, really. Then, as you saw, you just simply, you know, use the, the, the menu structure, you know, file and so on, and, and just, yeah, you're in, really. It's, it's really not difficult. Um, <clears throat> there is also Wordsmith Tools, which is a commercial product. It, it does a, a few tricks that this doesn't do, but not very many. And, uh, for most teaching purposes, this does more than enough. Um, all right, thunderstorms are back. <laughs> uh, 
um, and if we have time, I'm going to, I quite like to say something about uh, writing your own software, uh, even if you're not a programmer, but uh, it's becoming possible to do this, but uh, uh, I'm, we'll see if we have time for that. Uh, finally, uh, what about uh, data annotation? Some of you may know that uh, it's possible, once you've collected your corpus, to add information to it. Uh, this, is, this, in general, is known in corpus linguistics as annotation. And there's two kinds of annotation. One is called tagging, and the other one is called parsing. Uh, tagging is where you uh, attach a word class label to every word in the corpus. So if you, you have a phrase, you know, the beautiful tree. Uh, so the is, what is the? It's a determiner, yeah. So the will have, uh, yeah, it'll have a little tag that says something like DT. And if you've got a very detailed set of tags, it might tell you which type of determiner. Yeah, it's a definite article. Uh, most tag sets will just, just stop at determiner. Um, and they're beautiful. Adjective, and most tag sets, uh, the tag for adjective is JJ, don't ask me why, yeah, JJ. Uh, and uh, uh, a tree obviously is a noun, so there'll be a noun tag for that, okay. Uh, uh, taggers are, well, you know, many and varied now. I've, I think I wrote some on here, um, yes, um, part of speech tagging on here. Uh, there's, a, there's a tagger called QTag, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, this is, again, freely downloadable software, and it's very easy to run. Um, as you'll see, uh, it's a, a fairly kind of small set of tags. It doesn't, it doesn't have lots and lots of detail to it. It just has basic tag set. And it's not, it hasn't been trained on a lot of data, so it, its accuracy rate is not fantastic. It's, it's okay. It's pretty good. But uh, 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 the more you train these things, the, better, the more accurate they become, obviously. It's, it's not been trained ex very extensively. Uh, there's another one, uh, another freebie from Stanford University, the Stanford Tagger. It's a little bit more accurate. It's also free, but it's more for the computer geeks among you. It's, kind of, it's, not, it, it's not quite so easy to, uh, to, to work with. Um, and then there's a, 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 the best, most accurate tagger is the Clause Tagger, which was written by... Paul Rayson and colleagues at Lancaster University in Britain. The, the only problem with this is it's, it's commercial. You have to, basically, you send your data to, to uh, the clause tagging team, and they will tag it for you and send it back to you, which I guess is nice, but it doesn't, you know, it comes at a price. Alternatively, you can, bu you can uh, buy a license for a piece of software called W Matrix, which will, which will do it for you. But again, it, it's not free. So anyway, let's, let's have a quick look, shall we? Let's, let's have a look at uh, QTag in action. So again, this is something you can download for nothing. Um, what I've got, what I've prepared here is um, a very small text. Where is it? Definition. Um, I, th this, is a, this is a line from my Petra Kucha presentation yesterday. H here's uh, John Sinclair's definition of a corpus. So a corpus is a collection of naturally occurring language text chosen to characterize a state or variety of a language. Okay. And we're going to tag this now. I hope. I'm still th I still have Stephen Krashen's words ringing in my ears about technology. You know, one in four. <laughs> is, this, is this one of the one in fours? Uh, uh, we'll open QTag, um, which looks like this. There it is. It's a, it's a little cute applet. It's, it's Java, so it should run on any machine at all uh, that has Java installed. And you can see a very, very simple interface. It just says file to tag. And we're going to browse for that. Uh, it's on our desktop, isn't it? And it was called definition. So we just uh, um, open that. So that's loaded. And you can see uh, here in the, the big window at the, uh, underneath, it gives you various options, different tagging styles. Yeah? So you can tag it in slightly different ways. And uh, I, I don't have time to go into the complexities of this, but this is something you might recognize, XML. This is becoming increasingly the standard language encoding format globally, actually. Uh, so uh, this is a very popular format. It's a little, if, you, if you've looked at HTML, it uses the same sort of you know, Chevron system. Um, then there's another, uh, uh, another popular one in corpus linguistics is underscore. So you just have a, a, an underscore line and then the tag. Okay. Uh, another one is, is called tabula, which is like the same as the other one, the underscore one, but without the underscore. And then there's a, a, a geeks only one called complete, but <laughs> you, you really don't want to go there. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's, let's just do the simple underscore one. And we're going to start tagging now. Oh, it's done. That didn't take long, did it? 
Well, it was. A, and do you notice it's uh, rather conveniently put our file in a separate folder called tagged. Now, why is that a good idea? Yes, exactly, yes. And this is a really, really, really important principle. If you are going to do any kind of annotation of your data, it's essential that you keep an original plain text copy because you, know, you always want to go back to the plain text in the end. In fact, sometimes you may, not need, you may think, actually, I don't need to tag at all. Uh, you only need to tag if you want to find out grammatical information, actually. And if you're, if you're working with, you know, if you want to do collocations or multi-word units, you don't have to tag the data. So... Um, you know, uh, you, you may not even ever get around to doing this or need to. Okay, well, let's have a look anyway. Let's see how it got on. Um, uh, it's, it's kept it separate, which was nice. And it will look very different. It won't look... Uh, it'll be in a list. It, it basically puts one word on one line. But for, when we look at it in a, in a piece of software like Ancon, that won't matter. It will display, you know, in the same way. Uh, let's see how, it, how well did we do. The first word, a, is a DT. Yes. Uh, corpus. What do you think NN means? No, yes. Is? Bez. Yeah, B. It's, th it's the third person singular of the verb to be, so that's correct. Uh, then at is a determiner again. Collection is a noun. Of, in. In means preposition in this uh, tagging system, so that's correct, isn't it? Uh, naturally occurring, it's got wrong. It thinks that uh, naturally occurring is a verb gerund. I don't think it's a verb gerund, do you? No, so it's made a mistake there. And this is the thing, taggers do make mistakes. Uh, people who write these programs tell you, oh, our accuracy rate is 95%. And, well, that might be true, but, you know, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they make mistakes, inevitably. Um, language, noun, text, noun. Okay, so there's a com compound noun there. And then it thinks that the comma is a piece of punctuation, so that's correct as well. It got that right. Uh, chosen, it thinks, is a past participle. Yes? Okay, yes. Uh, two, it thinks, is, this is very strange, it thinks that two is a preposition. And it's not, it's an infinitive stem, isn't it? So it's made another mistake here. Uh, which is, and then it therefore thinks it characterises an adjective. And it's, got made that, it's gone a bit wild there. Uh, so, oh dear, not, not doing so well. Uh, then, okay, determine a noun. Uh, what do you think CC is? Co coordinating conjunction, and that's correct, isn't it? It is a coordinating conjunction at phrase level, yeah. Uh, variety, noun, of, preposition, at, determinate, language. Yeah, it's, I give it 7 out of 10 for that. That's not bad, yeah. Um, so that's, that's tagging for you. So if you want to have a play with that, uh, just download QTag from... Uh, Oliver Mason is the author of QTag. He's a colleague of mine at Birmingham University. And he's a, he's a, a computational linguist primarily. And um, if you just go to his webpage, you can download QTag for free. As you can see, it's extremely easy to use. Not entirely accurate, but none of them are. Okay, good. Um, as I said, parsing is a more complicated procedure still. This is where you analyse a sentence in terms of its grammatical syntactic structure. So, okay, here's the subject, here's the, 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 the verb group, you know, here's an indirect object and so on. And as you can imagine, that is even more inaccurate than tagging. You know? <laughs> so, uh, at best, parsers only achieve about 60% accuracy. So I, and I really don't think, for most teaching purposes, it's necessary to parse at all. In fact, as I said before, I, I, I even wonder whether it's necessary to tag, actually. Um, most of the stuff that we'll be looking at is not, not tagged data at all. Okay. Uh, if we uh, look at uh, page two of the handout now, um, I'd like to move on to uh, using this, this software to diagnose students' needs and difficulties. And actually, this is just to recap what we did to... Uh, uh, at the beginning. We, we looked at the, the Doug corpus, put, which was put together by Doug Huffer at uh, Dongguk University in Gongju, and uh, we looked at the case of uh, expect, and uh, if we look at the word expect in his corpus, we find that it, it occurs 37 times, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that students are using quite a lot, um, but we found that 30 out of 37 times, it's wrong. Okay, <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we've, we can do, we've done an analysis that, that uh, most frequently students use expect when they want to say, I look forward to something. So immediately, just by looking at this one word in our corpus sample, we can see a, a major problem that we can address directly with our students. And we can use material which they've generated, so it's immediately relevant to them and interesting to them. You can say, look, this is what you've written, or, or you know, your, your fellow students have written. Okay. Um, 
And then, yeah, we've got the, the correct version, expect, then hope comes in in third place, then predict, accept, I'm trusting, I'm not surprised that's an unclear, okay? Um, <clears throat> I, w I probably don't need to say any more about that. But, uh, I, I think the possibilities for this are just limitless, actually, and you, you could spend, uh, you know, you know, this is something that you can spend a lot of time doing uh, uh, and, and develop it in all sorts of interesting ways. You can also do multi-word unit analysis as well. Uh, perhaps we can... Have got time for that? Yeah, I think so. Um, what did I do with... Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, I, I'm, yeah, let's, let's, let's imagine that I'm interested in uh, what phrases the students use. Okay? We can do this. So let's look at... Um, can you see at the top, this works on our kind of tab system? Yeah, so, so we're in concordance at the moment. There's, there's a rather mysterious thing called concordance plot. And this tells you where the word occurs in your corpus. And so and each line represents one instance. I don't know how useful this is for teaching purposes, but um, yeah, there it is anyway. Oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, um, in, in this piece of software, do you notice the, ha the cursor becomes a, becomes a pointy, thing, pointy hand? whenever you uh, hover it over a, a, an instance. If you click there, it will take you to the, the uh, student's essay. So you see the whole essay, and you, it even shows you where it is as well in the essay, which is a pretty cool <laughs> feature. Um, oh dear, we've lost it. How do we get back to our concordance? Just, just click on the tab again. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it remembers where you were. Yeah. Okay, anyway, I, I digress. We're, we're going to look at some clusters, word clusters. Now, I, what I could do is this. I could use the word or, the, the word or phrase expect, and I can say, well, give me all of the multi-word expressions that students use featuring expect. I don't think, because there's only 37 hits, I don't think that's going to get, it's not going to get us very far. Let's, can you give me a more high-frequency word, please? Any, any, um, go. Go, yes, okay, go. Okay, let's see, what do they do with, with go? And uh, now here, uh, we can specify what size of cluster. I, I'll, I'll, um, I think I'll try three word clusters. And a min uh, I need to specify a minimum frequency. Let's say three is a minimum frequency, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's see what we get. Right. Uh, get, number one, go to the. Oh, no, no, to, yeah, it's to go to, sorry. And then want to go, go to the is number three. Then I could go. That sounds a bit strange, actually. I wonder about that one. Should we take a look? So we just click it, and it gives us all the I could goes. Yes. And they think, well, I want to, that's interesting. I, I could go skiing. I want to look at that in more detail. Again, you can just jump to the student's essay and see what the student is trying to say here. Oh, then we want to go back to our clusters. We do that. Okay. And then we, we, could, we could then say, let's look at four word sequences and so on. Okay. Um, Get, download it, play with it, see what you can do with it. Okay? Uh, I want to move on, because uh, I'm already running out of time, because uh, 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 I think you've basically got the idea. This is extremely simple software, very easy to use, limitless possibilities. It also comes with a readme file, so if, you're, you're, if I'm going a bit fast, I, I realize this is just watching someone else use software is not, not the same as you know, getting your own hands on it. So fortunately, it does come with an instruction manual, and it's extremely straightforward to use. Uh, so do, 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 get a, do get a copy and play with it. I'd like to talk a little bit about a project uh, that I've been involved in in Turkey now. Uh, so we're going to point three on my handout, designing and evaluating materials or syllabus or curriculum. And uh, uh, this, t this place is called Sabanju University in Istanbul. Uh, it's an English medium university, uh, and it, it has a, a structure where, whereby students have a kind of preparatory general EAP year, is that, that's a kind of pre-freshman year and they just do a kind of generic EAP course. And this course is uh, taught using a set of course books which they've actually written themselves. Very high quality. It looks like, you know, kind of it's published by OUP or something. It's fantastic, you know. Um, a set of three uh, general English, general academic English textbooks. Um, and then after that, the students go into their freshman year where they do basically content-based language teaching. And there are three strands. Um, they do mathematics, natural sciences, or social and political sciences, and they, they do a kind of content-based language teaching course for one, for one of those. And again, there are, uh, there's a full set of in-house materials uh, for each of those uh, tracks. Now, wh what um, they asked me to do was to help them uh, develop corpus resources for all of these uh, 
uh, programs. And what we've done is we've, we've uh, uh, built uh, pedagogic corpora. Now, I, I talked a little bit about pedagogic corpora yesterday, but pedagogic corpora are basically uh, corpus, corpora consisting of all the texts that the students will be exposed to during their classroom learning. In other words, the textbooks that they're using, any supplementary materials, uh, perhaps uh, transcripts of lectures, if you can get hold of those as well. And that becomes, in a sense, it sort of becomes the, 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 the corpus that the students will be working with. Um, and there's a, the, the, the pedagogic corpora that we've got, uh, one of them is called Beyond the Boundaries, which is the, the general English, uh, general EAP course book. And that's uh, 340, nearly 353,000 words. Then there's a, a, ma a maths corpus, mathematics. Then there's a natural science corpus and a SPS is social and political sciences. Okay? Uh, we've also built a learner corpus, like the, one, the, the Doug corpus. We, we've got a, a learner corpus based on the students writing in Turkey, that, that's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Currently, it stands at 350,000 words, but it's, it's actually that, that's, it's bigger than that now. It's probably more like five, a half a million now, so, and, and growing. Okay. Um, we're using AntConc and another tool called Sketch Engine, which I won't talk about today. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention a guy called Bennett Vincent, who's uh, the, the leader of the Corpus Project Group, who's, who's really put a lot of work into, into this. Uh, credit where it's due. Um, I'm going to, yeah, because I'm, I'm it's time to, yes. 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 In fact, that's something that we've, we've done. And uh, I, I was hoping to have time to show you, but I can already see that I don't have time to show you this. So. But yes, we've, we've, exactly, we've done exactly that. Yes, yeah. We've used it for assessment. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much time do I have, by the way? I'm, uh, um, five minutes. Yeah, I, yeah, gosh. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no. You just I, the, the, the student, we asked the students to word process just, 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 just in plain text files. Just send. So when they wrote an essay, rather than handwriting it, we got them to type it. So we didn't. And they just emailed it to us. Yeah. Yeah. Straight in. Yeah. 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 It's it's really very. Well. It's no work at all, really. Yeah. It, it would only become work if they were handwriting, and then you had to type it in. Yeah. Yeah. But if yeah, if you if you get them to just send it to you in electronic form, then it, it's not a problem at all. Okay, uh, this, this is just an example. I, I'm going to really skip briefly through this. This is an example of uh, a kind of consciousness-raising activity that we've designed for students. We're getting students to work with this kind of concordance data. Um, and I, I'm, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to say anything about this at all, I think. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was how we've used, the, the, we've used these resources to actually find out how good our materials are. Remember, there is this course book called Beyond the Boundaries, and uh, Beyond the Boundaries has a, quite a, a strong vocabulary building component in it. it has a, a, um, uh, each unit has a vocabulary list, uh, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good. But we wondered, after we, uh, when we started working with corporate, we wondered, well, you know, do we actually cover all the words that we need to be covering for when students go on to the next level? So we were looking at the Beyond the Boundaries corpus and saying, does this actually prepare students for the social and political sciences? You know, what, how much of coverage do we get? And we, we, we performed something called a keywords analysis, uh, um, which I, I'll briefly show you here. Um, if I, you know, I, I don't have time to do this. I'm really sorry. Basically, what we did was we uh, compared... Uh, the uh, Beyond the Boundaries corpus with the uh, 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 Social and Political Sciences corpus, and it told us which words uh, sh were not on the list but should be. And if you look on um, the third page of my handout here, can you see at the top of that one there? Um, and we've actually used the software to generate a list of words which we uh, 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 felt were already being covered well. Um, in Unit 1, uh, there were social and political science keywords which were already on the uh, students' vocabulary list from the foundation level, so we, we would expect them to, to, to know. And actually, there's only one, the word serve. And there's a whole bunch of really important words in Unit 1 of the social and political science materials which were not covered at all, uh, namely uh, uh, century, thus, 
semi, the, 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 the prefix, reform, household, industrial, seek, fund, and failed. And so we thought, oh gosh, we're not actually, you know, we're not preparing the students that well if we're, we're missing all these kind of key words, which are really, really important words in the first unit of this course book. Uh, now, you may be thinking, well, surely the students know fail. Fail is easy, right? But it's not actually. When you look at fail in the context of social and political sciences, it has a very specialised usage. Um, and briefly, the most important one of which is here, is like you don't do what you were expected to do, which is a little bit more kind of technical, if you like. Um, but uh, what I want to do briefly is show you how we did this. And this is the last thing I want to show you on this piece of software. It's something called a keyword analysis. So we go to a keyword list. Okay. And, and what I first of all need to do is uh, make sure that this is, yeah, okay, yeah. All right. So what we want to do is not work with the Doug corpus. I've got to get rid of that. Clear all tools and files. Um, and we're going to open a directory. Um, so uh, in answer to your question, this, this is how you do it. Basically, you've collected your data, you put it in a folder, and then you just load it onto the machine doing exactly what I'm doing, just browsing it like, you, just like you're accessing a, a Microsoft Word document that's buried somewhere on your system. Yeah? Uh, so here's me. Uh, it's on the desktop, I think. I put this on the desktop, yeah. And you can see here, this is the thing that I'm interested in then is the, the social and political sciences. And I want to find out about that. And there we are. So there's all the le it's lectures, uh, mainly lecture transcripts, but also some, some readings as well. Um, what I want to do is I want to find out which words are, if you like, uh, es especially important in this corpus compared to what the students already know. You know, uh, if you like, statistically significant in this corpus compared to uh, the other, the, what, what they've already been studying. Uh, so we're going to then, um, what we need to do now is select something to compare it against. So uh, come on, tool preferences, there you are. Uh, we need to select something called a reference corpus. So we'll uh, add a directory. And that's the beyond the boundaries corpus. So this is the, 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 uh, the, general, the general EAP course. Okay. So we'll open that uh, and apply it. Okay. And so what we do now is, is just press start. <laughs> um, and it says, oh, I need to jump to the word list tool to generate a word list. Because how this software works is it, it makes a word list for the two corpora and then compares the frequencies of the word lists. And then it does a statistical test to find out which words are more significantly frequently associated with one corpus than the other. Okay? And it's kind of smart. It knows that, that, oh, there isn't a word list. Shall I make one for you? Yes, please. So <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll ask it to do that. It shouldn't take long. Yes. It's done it. It's now finding out what the keywords are. There they are. That's kind of interesting, actually. Um, there's some weird stuff there. There's some uh, some mistakes, but uh, it's saying uh, that's interesting. It says the top, the, the most, the most significant word at, at the higher level is of, which actually isn't surprising, is it? Because what this this is a more specialised academic discourse than the general course books. So they're using more complicated noun phrases. I think that's why of is there. And then we've got uh, uh, political, as you'd expect, you know, in political science, uh, societies, state, Europe, Roman Empire, by, by. So by seems to be, maybe there's some kind of, you know, some kind of construction there, which is sort of important in political science. Uh, religious, peasant, peasants, women, and so on. So basically what this thing has done for you is it's given you a specialised vocabulary list automatically in about five seconds. Um, it's, and I don't know how, lo how long would it take you to develop uh, a vocabulary list for a social and political science class <laughs> manually. Uh, uh, years? A lifetime? My time is up. Yeah. Uh, uh, but using this software, you, as you can see, all you need to do is basically just compile uh, corpora based on textbooks for both of them, stick it in this machine, and say, please give me a vocabulary list which is uh, particularly associated with this field, and it will do it. Uh, in less time than it's taken me to explain it. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I had time to, 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 uh, to tell you more about this stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things which I didn't get around to talking about on this handout here. And right at the end, um, Julian, is, Julian is allowing me one extra minute to go over time. Yeah. Um, 
what I wanted to, what I'm really interested in, although I've spent nearly all this session talking about this software and how wonderful it is, and I, I hope you agree with me, it is wonderful. Oh, and by the way, once I should say, by, once again, if you, um, you wanted to produce some uh, materials based on the word nomads, you click on nomads and you're going to get all the nomads. You know, and if you want to find out where, oh, what are semi-nomads, we, we can go and find semi-nomads. So uh, it all works in the same way. Um, yeah, although I think this is wonderful. I think if you get really interested in this kind of stuff, you eventually become a kind of prisoner of the software. You know, you feel that, well, this is what I really want to do. I'm interested in this research question. I'm interested in doing this with the data. But the trouble is the software won't allow me to do it. It only does what it does. And that's why I'm really interested in people starting to develop their own software. And I've actually written some scripts here. This is using something called Unix tools. And um, if anyone is interested in that and it gets to the end of this and looks at this and thinks, oh, that's interesting, uh, do please drop me an email and say, how does that work? Uh, and I'll, I'll explain it to you. Basically, it just means uh, uh, you need to uh, go to this thing called a terminal window and type the script in. And it will do, well, what have I got here? I've got three scripts. Uh, basically, what you can do is you can generate a word frequency list without having any kind of software at all. You just write this script and put, it, put, put the file or the corpus name in, and it will ge generate a frequency list for you. The second script will find words that occur in two corpora, or two lists of words. And the third script will find words that occur in one corpus, but not in another one. Um, but that's, that's for another time. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry I didn't, uh, didn't have time to go through everything, but I hope at least... All I've tried to do is give you a flavor of, A, how easy this is to, to use, B, how much of a labor-saving device it is, and C, it kind of, I think it can take you to places you may not have been to before with your own uh, teaching. So uh, I hope you enjoy using it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.